Let's go into Unit 10, which covers the IRS examination process. In this webinar, we're going to talk about the IRS audit process. The IRS generally calls this an examination, and taxpayers will generally call this an audit, but it's the same thing. So a taxpayer will come to you with a notice and they'll say, I'm getting audited. And it's the same thing. It's an examination. The IRS accepts most tax returns as they are filed, but selects a small percentage for examination. The IRS examination is also commonly called an IRS audit. The IRS typically audits approximately 1% of the total number of individual tax returns filed. Higher income earners were audited much more frequently than those who earned less. The IRS reports that the audit rate for individual returns with a total income of $1 million or more was over 10%. If you make more than $1 million a year, then the chance that you're going to get audited is much higher than a person who is just middle class or lower income. Now, the exception to that rule for lower income taxpayers is that returns that are claiming refundable credits, such as the EITC, are also audited at a higher rate than normal returns. And that's because the IRS knows that these refundable credits are a fraud vector. So of all of the individual returns audited, more than a third were returns with earned income tax credit claims. So higher income earners, taxpayers who make more than a million dollars a year, are going to be audited at a higher rate than those that don't and taxpayers who claim EITC are also going to be audited at a higher rate than taxpayers who don't claim EITC on their tax returns. Types of audits. Now there's only three kinds, three types of audits and I think you need to know the difference for the exam. The three types of IRS examinations are a correspondence audit and this is conducted entirely by mail an office audit, which takes place at a nearby IRS field office, and a field examination, which typically takes place at a taxpayer's home or place of business. 99% of the audits that I have repped or responded to have been correspondence audits. I can count the number of office audits and field examinations that I've done on one hand, because these are rare. They take a lot more Mm, IRS resources, you know, especially the field examinations where the auditor goes out to the taxpayer's business or to their home, but the ones that I've done have always been a business, a business entity or a Schedule C taxpayer that had a separate business location. In that case, the IRS auditor actually has to come out and they examine the records at the business location. It usually takes several days, sometimes even several weeks for the audit to be closed. So the field examinations are the rarest and the correspondence audits are the most commonplace. The IRS conducts most examinations entirely by mail, around 73%. In these correspondence audits, a taxpayer will receive a letter asking for additional information about certain items shown on the return, such as proof of income, expenses, and itemized deductions. Correspondence audits typically occur when there is a minor issue that the IRS needs to clarify. For example, the IRS may have detected a math error, or there may be a discrepancy between the tax return and the 1099 statements sent by brokers, banks, or mutual funds. Other times, the IRS simply requests evidence that a particular transaction has transpired as reported on the tax return. Examples. Example number one. The IRS selects Evelyn's return for examination. Evelyn had claimed her older half-brother as a qualifying child based on his permanent disability, and she had also claimed head of household status. And we remember the rules in part one, right? So generally, you cannot claim a dependent that's older than you as a qualifying child. You can, you can always claim a dependent parent, and your parent is obviously going to be older than you, right? But a qualifying child generally has to be younger than the taxpayer unless the qualifying child has a permanent disability. So it is possible to claim a qualifying child that is an adult. They're treated as a qualifying child for tax purposes, even if they're older than you. And the most common situation where you're going to see this is when you have a disabled sibling and you have a younger sibling taking care of that disabled sibling after the parents have passed away. So that's a very common scenario. The IRS asks for proof of disability and residency, and Evelyn provides copies of doctor's records and additional evidence that her brother lives with her full time. 
The IRS accepts Evelyn's documents and closes the case as a no change audit. This is always what you want, no change audit. And we're gonna go over the different types of audits, the way that they can be closed, because you need to know that for the test too. But this basically means that the IRS accepted Evelyn's return as it was filed. Evelyn does not have to meet with an IRS auditor as the entire audit is conducted by mail. And the last audit that I did took several months, but it was also a correspondence audit like this, where the IRS was asking for proof of residency for the children and proof that the children actually belonged to the parents, that it was their kids and things like that. Example number two, Rocio receives a CP2000 notice saying that she has unreported wages. Rocio carefully reads the notice and realizes that the missing form W-2 has her name and social security number, but she has never worked for that company. In fact, the company is in a completely different state than where she currently resides. Someone has stolen Rocio's social security number. Rocio is a victim of employment related identity theft. Her SSN is being used by another person without her permission for employment purposes. Rocio responds to the notice and also files form 14039 identity theft affidavit reporting the identity theft. And this is the process. So this is becoming more and more commonplace. If you're doing tax returns or you have a few years of experience in this business, you've probably dealt with at least one of these scenarios where the taxpayer is a victim of ID theft. In this case, the IRS thinks that she has unreported wages, but she doesn't. So she has to respond to this notice affirmatively saying that this is these are not my wages. I've never worked for this company. And she also should file an identity theft affidavit. A few weeks later, the IRS sends her a letter that it has accepted her return as filed. Rocio should also consider obtaining an identity theft protection pin to protect her account against tax related identity theft. And generally, the IRS will send the uh, IP pin out automatically. But the last ID theft case that I had was very similar to this, where it was employment related ID theft. And we filed the identity theft affidavit for the taxpayer. And the IRS still hasn't really processed still hasn't really processed it yet because they're so behind they're dealing with so much id theft at at this time and i actually called the practitioner priority line about it just about a week ago and they said you know we're about 12 months behind on these so if you do have a person who is a victim of id theft file the identity theft affidavit and also request an ip pin for that person that's the that's the best thing that you can do for them and of course if they do get a notice relating to unreported wages or unemployment compensation that's another really common one where people have had their ids stolen in order for some fraudster to claim unemployment in their name you have to respond to the notice okay there's a lot of that going on right now how returns are selected for examination? The IRS selects returns for examination using a variety of methods, including potentially abusive or tax avoidance transactions. This is what I was talking about before when I was talking about tax shelter promoters. If the IRS discovers a, a tax shelter promoter where they're promoting an abusive tax shelter or an abusive trust, what they'll do is they'll come in and audit the promoter and get a, a, a list of their entire client base and then they will basically audit every single one of their clients in order to find unreported income or people who are basically participating in this tax shelter and not reporting it. Okay, so this is also, this is very common. Computer scoring or diff score. Returns may be chosen on a basis of computer scoring. A computer program called the Discriminant Inventory Function System, the DIF assigns a numeric score to each individual and certain corporate tax returns after they have been processed. So the diff score is basically a numerical value that the IRS computers assign to a taxpayer's return once it's been processed. And if the diff score hits like a certain level, nobody knows very much about it because there's been Freedom of, freedom of Information Act requests where Taxpayers have asked the IRS to release information about how they do this, how their diff scoring system works, and the IRS has never released that information. It's all a big secret. <laughs> so nobody knows quite how this works. There's been a lot of speculation and some universities and some 
tax professionals have tried to do kind of a sampling of audited returns to try to figure out exactly how the IRS selects returns for examination based on the DIF score, but it's all speculation. So we kind of have a good idea of what the IRS is looking for, but it's all kind of an educated guess. If the taxpayer's return gets assigned a score that's either too high or too low, the IRS will select that return for examination, presumably, or it's gonna go into hand processing and somebody's gonna look at it and decide whether or not to proceed with an audit. No, like I said, nobody knows quite how this works, but if you do see a question on the diff score, just realize that this is a numerical value that the IRS computers assign to tax returns once they've been processed. And if the number is a certain value, then the IRS might audit that tax return. Information matching. This is also a very common way that the IRS selects returns for examination, especially for correspondence audits. And that's when third party reports like information statements like a W-2 or a 1099 do not match the applicable amounts reported on the tax return. And this happens very often with identity theft. And it also happens pretty often to self-employed taxpayers where they will receive a 1099 that's wrong or they'll receive a duplicate 1099 or they'll receive a 1099 miscellaneous when it's supposed to be a 1099 NEC and vice versa. So this is also a very common type of correspondence audit when the information that the IRS has doesn't match what was reported on the taxpayer's return. Related examinations. Returns may be selected for audit when they involve transactions with or issues related to other taxpayers, such as business partners or investors whose returns were selected for examination. And the most common situation where this will happen is when you have an audit of a business or an audit of like a trust and the IRS finds abuses at the entity level and then they will just audit, you know, all the shareholders or all the partners or all the beneficiaries of the trust after they audit the entity. If they see that there's deductions that were improper at the entity level, then they'll audit any of the beneficiaries or partners or whatever of that entity because they know that if the deductions were being taken improperly here at the top at the entity then basically you know the pass-through income isn't going to be correct for the beneficiaries the shareholders and the partners in that entity as well okay third-party information returns may be selected for audit as a result of information received from other third-party sources or individuals sources may include state and local law enforcement agencies public records and individuals the information is evaluated for reliability and accuracy before it is used as the basis of an examination or a possible criminal investigation. And let me give you some examples. Harvey is an EA with a client, Jamila, who received an audit notice this year. Jamila's prior year tax return was selected because she had a large number of tax credits and very little taxable income. However, her return was prepared correctly. Jamila had adopted four special needs children and was able to take the earned income credit and a large adoption credit. Harvey provided proof of the adoptions to the examining officer, which resulted in a positive outcome for Jamila, a no change audit. So this type of return is, is an example of a, of a return that might be selected for audit under the DIFF scoring system. If you have a person who has very little taxable income, but huge amounts of credits and a huge refund, then that's a situation where the IRS might actually come in and audit the return. But that doesn't mean that the return was prepared incorrectly or that the taxpayer wasn't eligible for those credits. It just means that there's a higher chance that the IRS will audit the return if there's very little income and a huge tax refund or a lot of tax credits for that taxpayer. In this case, though, the taxpayer wasn't doing anything wrong and they were able to prove that all of the credits were, le were legitimate and that these were her adopted children, which resulted in a no change audit. So that means that the IRS accepted the return as filed. Example number two, Alfred embezzled money from his employer and was arrested for felony embezzlement. The case was made public and the police shared its information with the IRS. The IRS then contacted Alfred and proposed adjustments to his tax returns, assessing additional tax, interest, and penalties for fraud for failing to report the embezzled funds as income. So if you, if you have income from criminal activity 
it's still taxable. Most of the time, those people obviously aren't going to report that income. So the way that the IRS finds out about this sort of thing is after a person has been convicted. And this is a common type of third party sharing information between law enforcement and the IRS. So this is an example of third party information that can trigger an IRS criminal investigation. Taxpayer examination rights and obligations. An IRS examiner must explain the examination and collection process and the taxpayer's rights during the process. These rights include a right to professional and courteous treatment by IRS employees, a right to privacy and confidentiality about tax matters, a right to know why the IRS is asking for information, how the IRS will use it, and what will happen if the requested information is not provided, a right to representation either by oneself or an authorized representative, and a right to appeal disagreements both within the IRS and before the courts. So the IRS can send you a notice and you have the right to appeal within the IRS and you also have a right to appeal to the US court system. And I'm gonna go over that a little bit more later, but you can actually choose. You don't have to actually appeal within the IRS if you don't want to. So you have the right to just bypass the IRS appeals process and the IRS examination process altogether if you want. But of course, if you're gonna to go to court, that costs money. Court filings are not free and lawyers also don't work for free. So the benefit of appealing disagreements with the IRS within the IRS appeal system or within the, within the IRS examination system is that you don't have to pay the tax first if you are appealing within the IRS system itself. During an examination, the IRS has the right to confirm every item on a taxpayer's return. Form 4564, Information Document Request, is used to request information from the taxpayer. The taxpayer must make available any documents the IRS requests, including providing access to bookkeeping files such as QuickBooks. If a taxpayer fails to produce requested documents, an examiner must determine whether to issue a summons to secure, secure the documents. Now, this is the IRS's official line. I want you to know that many times when the IRS examiner gives you an information document request, it's really broad. Like they're reaching for the moon. They want everything. And many times as tax practitioners, we have to decide whether or not they're asking for too much information. Like many times the IRS examiner will be examining one year but they, they will put multiple years on the information document request. Like they'll say, okay, I want to see, we're examining, you know, a particular year, but I want to see last year's tax return and last year's invoices and last year's QuickBooks file. And, you know, we have to decide as tax practitioners and representatives if that's against our client's best interest. But if, if the IRS position is that if it's on the information document request, they have a right to see it. But if you don't produce the requested documents, an examiner has to determine whether to issue a summons in order to secure the documents. And an IRS examiner can do this. They can issue a summons, but they have to jump through a lot of additional hoops in order to do that. And what I'm telling you in this webinar is basically how to pass a test. So I have to tell you exactly what the IRS position is. There's a lot of good resources out there to teach you how to become a better representative and how to represent your clients before the IRS. But basically what I have to teach you in this webinar is the IRS party line. Basically what their position is on what you have to do and what the taxpayer has to do. But the taxpayer has a lot of rights before the IRS and also before the courts. And you have to understand that as a representative going in, okay? Now I'm going to recommend a resource to you if you want to do more representation or tax resolution. Tax resolution is basically how to help a taxpayer solve a tax problem, how to navigate the examination division, how to file OICs, offers and compromise, that sort of thing. The ASTPS, this is the American Society of Tax Problem Solvers. I'm not affiliated with them except as a member. So I joined last year or the year before and I found that the courses that this um, group offers, American Society of Tax Problem Solvers, are really fantastic. So fantastic speakers, really great classes, and they only teach tax resolution. So it's for enrolled agents, lawyers, and CPAs. 
they're an exempt organization. They're an exempt organization, and they're just really great, really great speakers, really great classes. I've learned a lot from them, and I've been in this business for decades already. It's just I don't, <laughs> I don't really like representation work, and I don't actively pursue it. I do it for my existing clients, but I always feel like I could learn more about this, and I've learned a lot from ASTPS, from their speakers. Their speakers are great. So once you become an enrolled agent, I do recommend them if you want to learn more about tax resolution. I always like to basically make recommendations for things that I have tried and I really like. Like I recommended the tax book in one of the other webinars. I'm not affiliated with the tax book either. And I think that that's probably the best online resource for, you know, just when you need to look something up, the tax book is great. Their search function on their online tax book, I don't buy the paper version anymore because Congress has been crazy lately with all of their retroactive tax changes and I couldn't stand it. But if you do the online version, it updates like in real time. So I love the tax book and I also think that ASTPS is great. So like I said, they're a nonprofit and they do great education if you want to learn how to do representation work and represent taxpayers at audit and all that sort of thing. So great organization to join, I think, personally. A taxpayer's representative. A taxpayer may always represent himself or herself during examination. Alternatively, the taxpayer may use a qualified representative before the IRS. The taxpayer does not have to attend the audit if the rep representative has the proper power of attorney authorization. We're talking about a Form 2848 and is an enrolled practitioner under Circular 230. If a taxpayer becomes uncomfortable during the audit and wishes to consult with a qualified representative, the IRS must suspend the interview and reschedule it. They are required to by law. So if, for example, a taxpayer is going through an examination and they're trying to do it themselves and they get uncomfortable with the questions that the auditor is asking them and they say, I don't want to I don't want to do this interview anymore. I want to seek representation. I want to find a CPA, an enrolled agent, or an attorney to help me. The IRS has to stop the examination and reschedule it. They have to allow the taxpayer to seek qualified representation if they wish. Example, representatives. Example number one, Kimberly is an EA. A taxpayer named Lloyd hires her to represent him before the IRS during the examination of his tax return. Lloyd does not want to attend the audit. And just to be honest, that's generally the best thing. It's better if the taxpayer is not involved in the process at all. Sometimes the IRS examiners will push for that. They want to actually speak with the taxpayer. And that's because they know that taxpayers get really nervous. And they'll like, <laughs> they'll say things that they shouldn't say. So an enrolled agent, an attorney, and a CPA, those are all enrolled practitioners. And if an enrolled practitioner is representing the taxpayer before the IRS, then the taxpayer does not have to attend the audit. They don't have to communicate with the IRS at all. Lloyd signs form 2848 indicating that Kimberly is now his authorized representative for all tax matters. Kimberly attends the examination on Lloyd's behalf, so he doesn't have to be there. And it's best if he's not. <laughs> just, just that's how it is. It's best if they're not there. Example number two. Mitchell is a 23-year-old accounting student who is not an enrolled practitioner, but he is currently studying for the CPA exam, so he has some tax knowledge. So he's just an accounting student. He's 23, so he's a young guy, and he's not an enrolled practitioner yet. He's studying for the CPA exam, but he doesn't have any licensing, so he wouldn't be able to represent clients before the IRS. However, the IRS mails an audit notice to Mitchell's older sister, Amy, Amy does not want to speak to the IRS, so she designates Mitchell as her authorized representative by signing and submitting Form 2848 to the IRS. Mitchell may practice before the IRS in this limited circumstance because of the familial relationship with the taxpayer. This is his sister. Mitchell has full representation rights before the IRS with regards to his sister's tax issue. So he has limited representation rights because of familial relationship, not because of licensing. As an enrolled agent, you have practice rights due to your licensing. In this case, he would have practice rights due to familial relationship. And this would be the same if it was a situation where like you were representing your own child. Like I can represent my own child and that would be true even if I wasn't an enrolled agent, okay? Because of the familial, familial relationship. 
Example number three, Brant is a self-employed mechanic who owns an auto body shop. The IRS is auditing his return, the amounts reported on his Schedule C, so he's self-employed. A licensed CPA prepared his return, but Brant doesn't want to pay the CPA to represent him during the audit. And to be honest, this actually happens pretty frequently because an audit is considered a separate engagement. Many times taxpayers don't want to pay the hourly fee for an audit and it can be pretty pricey, right? So most enrolled agents and CPAs and lawyers will charge several hundred dollars an hour to represent a client before the Internal Revenue Service. Either that or they'll charge a flat fee but it's not unusual for representation during an audit to cost several thousand dollars. It's not cheap most of the time. So he doesn't want to pay the CPA to represent him during the audit. So he tries to represent himself during the examination in order to save money. Brant meets with the IRS auditor at his shop. The auditor begins asking complicated questions and Brant becomes uncomfortable right away. He regrets not hiring someone to represent him. Brant tells the IRS auditor that he wants to discontinue the audit because he wants to hire someone to represent him. The auditor must immediately suspend the audit and allow Brant time to seek representation. So I worked for a firm, I worked for a CPA firm before I became a sole practitioner. And this actually happened quite a bit because the CPA office charged, I don't remember, 300 and something dollars an hour for audit representation. And that's not unusual in California. I know with a, my lawyer's office, because I have an intellectual property attorney, it's even more than that. It's 400 and something dollars an hour. So it's not cheap. Audit representation is not cheap, which is why so many, <laughs> so many tax practitioners actually like doing rep work. It's a great way to make money. But a lot of times taxpayers at the beginning, they will try to represent themselves and then they become tangled in the, during the examination and really uncomfortable and then they'll seek representation after they've already started the audit process because they don't really know how to navigate it. Audits of joint returns. When a jointly filed tax return, a married filing joint tax return is selected for examination, either spouse may meet with the IRS or the qualified representative may meet with the IRS without either spouse present. Without an administrative summons, the IRS cannot compel a taxpayer to accompany an authorized representative to an examination interview. And I've never had this happen, just to let you know. I've never had the IRS use a summons to compel a taxpayer to uh, accompany me during an examination interview. But I have had several instances where it was an audit of a joint return and only one spouse was communicating with me or I was only representing one spouse. Often that will happen when the spouse is divorced or when they're estranged or separated and it's a joint return and one of the spouses just wants to act like it's not happening. They get like the, the ostrich thing where they wanna put their head in the sand and act like the audit's not happening and they just won't respond. But then the other spouse is like the responsible one <laughs> and they will respond and you can represent just one spouse in an examination of a joint return. And I've done that multiple times. And both times it was actually the wife, was I was representing the wife, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter which spouse actually responds. Many times you will be representing them both, but you can represent just one spouse because both spouses have joint and several liabilities. So they have to respond because the IRS can go after them both. So you can have a scenario where, you, where you're just representing one spouse and you only have a 2848 for one spouse. And most of the time the IRS just has to deal with it. The examiners sometimes don't like it, but I tell them the other spouse is non-responsive and that's it. And we deal with the audit as it is. Example, Lucia and Javier are married and have always filed jointly. During the year, Lucia and Javier receive an audit notice Lucia tries to encourage Javier to hire a representative, but Javier refuses to respond to the notice or participate in the audit process. Since it is a joint return, both spouses are jointly and severally liable for all the items shown on the return. Lucia contacts Mohammed, a licensed CPA, and hires him to represent her during the audit process. Mohammed obtains a signed Form 2848 from Lucia and speaks with the IRS on his client's behalf. So he's only representing her. But that's fine because the spouse doesn't want to participate. They can't force him to basically. They can't force him. They can't force him to do anything. So she, he is her representative, and she's trying 
to respond to the examination as best she can. Mohammed does not represent Javier. He only represents Lucia. Lucia can have Mohammed represent her during the IRS audit process, and she does not need to be present. Mohammed will do his best to represent Lucia during the audit process. Notice of IRS contact of third parties. During the examination process, the IRS may contact third parties regarding a tax matter without the taxpayer's permission. Third parties may include neighbors, banks, employers, or employees. However, the IRS must give the taxpayer reasonable notice before contacting other persons about individual tax matters. The IRS must provide the taxpayer with record of the persons contacted, either on a periodic basis or upon the taxpayer's request. This requirement does not apply to any pending criminal investigation. So if it's a criminal investigation, then the IRS does not have to provide notice of contact of third parties. When providing notice would jeopardize collection of any tax liability. When providing notice may result in rep a reprisal against any person or when the taxpayer has already authorized the contact. And I'm gonna give you an example of when the taxpayer might wanna authorize the contact. I had an audit several years ago, many years ago, where the taxpayer, the taxpayer's business was under audit and the examiner requested copies of very old bank statements for a bank that he no longer banked at. Like he no longer had an account with that bank. He had the QuickBooks file. We'd done his tax returns and we had the QuickBooks file, but he didn't have copies of the bank statements anymore. So we had reconciled the bank statements and QuickBooks and everything was there, but the auditor wanted to see copies of the bank statements and the bank was going to charge like $15 for every bank statement <laughs> in order to get copies. So they requested copies of the bank statements. And I actually went to the auditor and I said, look, he doesn't bank with this bank anymore. And the bank wants a lot of money to get these bank statements. So can you get copies of the bank statements? And the, and the IRS auditor said, sure. <laughs> and she issued a summons to the bank. And the taxpayer was actually perfectly happy with that because we had reconciled the bank statements in QuickBooks and all of the information in QuickBooks was correct. It was all above board, but she wanted to see copies of the bank statements as well as the canceled checks. And they were gonna charge the taxpayer a ton of money. And we, were, we just asked her, can you issue a summons to the bank and get it? And she said, sure. And she did it. So she issued a summons to the bank directly. We gave her authorization for the contact and she did it. And she got all of the copies and then gave them, gave copies to us. So it really worked out well. So sometimes third party contact isn't a bad thing. So especially when it's something like that, where it maybe the taxpayer doesn't have copies of the information that the IRS wants maybe they just have like their accounting file in Sage or QuickBooks, but they're okay with the IRS actually obtaining copies of the bank statements or whatever, or the brokerage statements. And you can just give permission for that and it's fine. Okay. Example of third-party contact. The IRS selects reads tax return for audit. The auditor sees several clues and immediately suspects unreported income related to criminal activity. Now, in this case, Reed is doing something bad. Maybe the IRS suspects that there's criminal activity, maybe drug dealing or money laundering or something like that. The IRS auditor discovers that Reed is also being investigated by the FBI and the Department of Justice for drug trafficking. Because this is a pending criminal investigation, the IRS is not required to give Reed notice before contacting the FBI or the Department of Justice about Reed's tax matters. So in this case, the IRS doesn't have to tell him that they're doing this. They don't have to tell him that they're contacting, you know, federal authorities or the police about the tax matters because there's they suspect criminal activity. Audit determinations. An audit can be closed in one of three ways. No change. An audit in which the taxpayer has substantiated all of the items being reviewed and results in no changes. This is what you want. This is an ideal outcome. This is where you file a tax return. It goes under audit. The IRS examines the return and accepts everything as filed. They say, okay, everything is right. And we're just going to accept the tax return as filed. The second way an audit can be closed is agreed. An audit in which the IRS proposes changes and the taxpayer understands and agrees with the changes. Most of the time when an audit is closed agreed, it's a situation where 
maybe the IRS has made changes to the tax return and there's a small adjustment, like they've disallowed a few things and it's a couple hundred dollars or maybe even a couple of thousand dollars. And the taxpayer says, okay, I'll just deal with it. And I wanna close this audit, I'll pay the additional tax and that's it. And they agree to the changes. Sometimes an audit can be closed agreed and the taxpayer will actually receive a, a refund. I've seen that too, although that is more rare. It happens like, I think the last time I read an estimate about this, it happens only like 10% of the time or 20% of the time, but that can happen too. It can happen where a taxpayer's tax return will go under audit and they'll actually receive a refund. So there are adjustments, but they're in the taxpayer's favor. So I've seen that happen too. And that'll happen most often when you have a taxpayer who maybe they're kind of sloppy or they've forgotten something on the tax return. And then when they do go under audit, they go and they like dig everything up out of all of their files. They go through their emails, <laughs> they go through their computer and they find all the information that they can, all of the receipts and everything. And they just clean everything up and you're able to basically provide the auditor with an even more complete set of books and sometimes that will result in a, in changes that actually are in the taxpayer's favor so i've seen that it's just not as common now the third way that an audit can be closed is unagreed and this is when you have to continue this is when it's not over <laughs> it's not over when an audit is closed unagreed that means that the irs has proposed changes and the taxpayer understands but the taxpayer disagrees with the changes. They say, okay, the auditor is disallowing all of these deductions or they're disallowing this credit and the taxpayer understands, but they don't agree. They wanna continue. They wanna to continue to fight it. A conference with an IRS manager may be requested for further review of the issues. In addition, the taxpayer may request fast track mediation or appeal. So the IRS, when it's an unagreed audit, the IRS will propose changes and then the taxpayer has to decide what they want to do at that point. When an audit is closed unagreed, the taxpayer basically has to decide at that point whether or not they want to go to IRS appeals, whether or not they want to go to the U.S. tax court, or whether they want to take it to another court, like a U.S. district court. They have to decide at that point what they want to do. They can't just leave it. It's not over. If the audit is closed, no change or agreed, then you sign a closing letter and it's over. That year is closed. It's like you've closed the book on the deal and generally the IRS will not reopen the audit. But if an audit is closed unagreed, then it's gonna continue. The taxpayer has to decide what they're gonna do next. And we're gonna cover the appeals process in the next webinar after this one. But just realize that with a no change and an agreed audit, that means that it's over you've agreed or it's no change and then that year is basically closed but if it's unagreed that means that the taxpayer wants to continue to fight closed examinations if an irs audit is closed like for example it's closed as agreed or it's closed as a no change audit the irs will not typically reopen a closed examination case to make an unfavorable adjustment and assess additional tax unless there was fraud or misrepresentation there was a substantial error based on the established IRS position existing at the time of the examination or failure to reopen the case would be a serious administrative omission. I have never seen this happen, just personally. I have never seen the IRS reopen a closed examination that was closed agreed or that was closed as a no change audit. I've never seen this happen. It can happen. For example, if the IRS discovers that there was fraud or some huge error or whatever, but personally, I have never experienced this. The IRS reopening a closed examination is unusual. It almost never happens. Audit reconsideration. In certain cases, the IRS will reevaluate re the results of a prior audit if additional tax was assessed and remains unpaid or a tax credit was reversed. A taxpayer may request reconsideration if he disagrees with an earlier audit assessment, but he must provide new information with documentation that was not considered during the original examination. The IRS may accept a taxpayer's reconsideration request if information that is submitted has not been considered previously. The taxpayer filed a return after the IRS completed a substitute return for him. 
The taxpayer believes the IRS made a computational or processing error in assessing his tax, or the tax liability remains unpaid or credits are denied. And I'm going to give you an example of when this might happen. Cedric is a sole proprietor who files on a Schedule C. After an IRS examination, he was assessed $1,900 of additional taxes because he had lost the file with his receipts and other documentation supporting his business deductions. Cedric disagrees with the findings of the examination, and a couple of weeks later, he finds the missing file, which includes his original receipts. Cedric requests an audit reconsideration due to the new documentation. So this would be a situation where the taxpayer is requesting that the IRS reopen the case. The tax is still unpaid, so he hasn't paid the tax yet, but he didn't have any proof of his, of his deductions. And then he found the file after. So now he wants the IRS to reopen the case because he believes that the audit reconsideration will be in his favor. Okay, this is not a situation where the IRS is reopening the case. This is a situation where the taxpayer themselves is asking the IRS to reopen the case. Example number two, Gracie receives a notice number CP504. The notice says urgent. The IRS intends to levy certain assets. Gracie has moved in the prior year and also hadn't filed a tax return, so the IRS did not have an updated address for her. She did not respond to any prior notices because she did not receive them. And this is pretty common too. Taxpayers who move, they rarely update their address with the IRS. And sometimes if they're delinquent filers anyway, or if they didn't have a tax liability or didn't believe that they had a tax liability, for example, if they made very small amounts of wages and they thought that they were under the filing requirement, sometimes the IRS will send notices to those people and they won't get the notices because the IRS doesn't have an updated address for them. So she didn't get any notices, so she couldn't respond to the notices. And the IRS just basically closed the case without ever talking to her. So the tax has already been assessed. The IRS basically closed the audit because she never responded. But Gracie doesn't believe that she owes the amount listed on the notice. Gracie may request an audit reconsideration. She never got the notices because she moved. So now she's asking the IRS to reopen the audit so she can get audit reconsideration. Okay. Repeat examinations. So, <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you the IRS's official position on repeat examinations. You, you need to know the official position of the IRS on repeat examinations, but I'm also going to tell you the reality, the reality of what really happens in real life. The, the IRS apparently tries to avoid repeat examinations of the same items, but sometimes this happens. If a taxpayer's return was audited for the same items in the previous two years and no change was proposed to tax liability, the taxpayer may request that the IRS discontinue the examination. The taxpayer may request, request that the IRS discontinue the examination. So if a taxpayer gets audited three years in a row for the same items like charitable gifts, and there's no change, no change. And then the third year, they audit the taxpayer again for the same items. You can request, apparently, <laughs> for the IRS to discontinue the examination. Okay, and let me give you an example. Eleanor donates a large percentage of her salary to the church. For the last two years, the IRS has selected Eleanor's return for examination based on her large donations. In both instances, Eleanor was able to substantiate her donations and no change was made to her tax liability. And actually, what I've noticed is sometimes this will happen sometimes with retired people. So I've had several instances where it was a retired person and they had money and they, they didn't have a whole lot of money coming in, but they also didn't have like young kids, their house was paid off, you know, their cars are paid off. So they didn't have a whole lot of expenses, like living expenses. So they donated huge amounts to their church. They liked to go to church. They liked to donate to their church. So they did. They made really large donations to their church. And sometimes this will be an audit trigger. That doesn't mean that the tax return is prepared incorrectly or that the deductions were invalid or anything else like that. But sometimes it will trigger an audit if the amount of the charitable gift is very high in comparison to the taxpayer's actual taxable income. 
In both instances, Eleanor was able to substantiate her donations and no change was made to her tax liability. Her tax return is selected again for the same reason in the current year. Eleanor contacts the IRS to request that the examination be discontinued and the examining officer agrees to do so. So this is the official position of the IRS. I just want you to realize that this is probably never gonna happen. Probably never gonna happen. If the IRS audits a taxpayer two years in a row for the same thing and there's a no change audit and they audit them again. And if you just request nicely for them to just discontinue the examination, it's probably still not gonna happen because this is a request. <laughs> the IRS can still say no. And I've never had a situation where the IRS discontinued the audit just because you asked, <laughs> even if it's a situation like this, okay? But the IRS's official position is if there's repeat examinations and the taxpayer had no changes in the last two examinations, that the IRS will discontinue the examination on the third year if you ask nice. But I just, I want you to realize that don't expect this to happen in real life because it's probably not gonna happen. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, last one is the centralized partnership audit regime. I talk about this in part two because it has to do with partnerships, which is an entity type that you have to know about for part two. But I also talk about it in part three because it's an audit regime. So it has to do with the audit of partnerships. The centralized partnership audit regime, which is CPAR. So whenever you see CPAR in accounting circles, that's what we're talking about is the centralized partnership audit regime. Before CPAR, it was TEFRA. And TEFRA was the audit regime that was in place before the centralized partnership audit regime. This is a new audit regime that was implemented where if you have a large partnership or even a small partnership that doesn't opt out of this thing, because you can opt out of the centralized partnership audit regime if it's a small partnership, and generally we recommend that you do, but if it's a large partnership with 101 or more partners, so over 100 partners, then that partnership can't opt out. If it's a situation where the partnership gets audited by the IRS and adjustments are made, then they won't go chasing any of the individual partners for the additional tax. They will just assess tax at the partnership level. So this is the time where a partnership can pay income tax is because of this, because of the centralized partnership audit regime. If a partnership gets selected for audit and it's under CPAR and the IRS makes adjustments then they will assess the actual partnership itself. The partnership itself will be assessed the additional tax. The IRS will not go chase the individual partners for the tax. Eligible partnerships can elect out of CPAR on a special schedule, it's schedule B2, if they file a timely filed return. So if the return is delinquent, you can't opt out of this thing anymore, which is terrible <laughs> because <laughs> CPAR is awful. But when an entity elects out, IRS proceedings and adjustments will be assessed at the partner level instead, which is what you want. So let's say you have a partnership that's small and it's four partners, but one partner is the one that's receiving the majority of the income. And if there's an adjustment, then most of the tax is gonna be assessed to him. If, the, if that partnership doesn't opt out of the centralized partnership audit regime, then the IRS will just assess the tax at the partner level and the whole partnership will be responsible for it, which means every partner's got to kick in. But if, it's, if the partnership elects out of CPAR, then the IRS basically has to make the adjustments at the partner level, okay? Which is more difficult for the IRS, but it's better for the partners individually, obviously, right? Because it's going to be more equitable. The partners that actually owe the tax are the ones that are going to pay it. But under the central, centralized partnership audit regime, the IRS is just going to assess the tax at the partnership level, and then the partnership itself has to pay. Now, I think you need to know which type of partnerships can actually elect out of this thing. If a partnership has more than 100 partners, so 101 partners or more, then that's considered a large partnership and the partnership can't elect out. Okay, number one. Number two, the partnership has to have 
only eligible partners, which means they can only be individuals, natural persons, humans, C corporations, S corporations, or estates of deceased partners only, not bankruptcy estates. So if one of the partners files for bankruptcy and their partnership interest actually passes to a bankruptcy estate because they filed for bankruptcy, then the partnership itself cannot opt out of CPAR anymore. So only the estate of a deceased partner is an eligible partner. A bankruptcy estate is not an eligible partner. An eligible partner also does not include a disregarded single member LLC, which actually ends up hitting a lot of partnerships in this case, because a lot of individual taxpayers will set up a single member LLC in order to hold their partnership interests. But if the partnership interest is actually held by a single member LLC, even if it's disregarded for every other purpose, then that's not an eligible partner anymore. It has to be held individually by a human, by an individual human person. If it's held through a single member LLC, then it's not an eligible partner anymore. If it's held by a trust, even a grant or trust, which is also disregarded for tax purposes most of the time, that's no longer an eligible partner anymore, or a bankruptcy estate. And this is true even if, if the disregarded entity is wholly owned by an eligible partner. Partnerships with non-qualified partners cannot opt out of the centralized audit regime, even if the partnership has fewer than 100 partners. Okay, so let's say you have a partnership, it only has 10 partners. Most of the time that partnership would be able to opt out. But if one of the partners is holding their partnership interest through a trust, even if it's a grant or trust, then the partnership itself cannot opt out of CPAR anymore. Okay? And this is what the Schedule B2 looks like when they make the election out of the centralized partnership audit regime. You have to do it every single year. This is a sample. These are not real people. This is These are not real, <laughs> real taxpayers. I just made up these taxpayer identification numbers. But every single partnership that I do that can opt out of this thing, they do. Okay, they do to opt out. So this is what the schedule looks like. It has to be attached to the form 1065, as you can see up here. The taxpayer identification number goes here, whether it's an entity or an individual, and you put the type of eligible partner that it is. If it's an individual taxpayer, a natural person, then the partner code is I, okay? And you have to opt out every single year if you're gonna opt out, okay? That's it, that's the end. Next unit is unit 11, 12, and 13, which covers IRS appeals, the e-file program, and identity theft.